To learn about the off-grid lifestyle and to be inspired to live your dreams, click subscribe so you don't miss anything. Hit the bell notification. So last night we had a pretty significant storm come through. It's probably the worst that we've been through since we've started the off-grid lifestyle. It, it was pretty bad. I mean, a lot of rain too. The creek down there, I can hear it just going crazy, which is kind of actually a nice sound. But it, it appears that everything held up pretty good. The camper did all right. Now, I, I put a tarp over my new outdoor wood furnace. I was sealing the seams with furnace cement on the inside, and I didn't want any rain to get into it. Well, it blew the tarp off, so I had to redo a little bit of the cement down at the bottom. This is like the third storm we've had, and we're supposed to have another one today. It's supposed to be raining right now, as a matter of fact. Now, one of the things I was uh, concerned about, obviously, is my well. We have an old, ancient <laughs> well. I bet it's it's got to be at least 40 years old. And it's in desperate need of repair. And I've been repairing it as we go along. Well, one of the things I had to do was I put this coffee can here. Now that's just temporary and I'll talk about that in a minute. But one of the things I had to do was I had to re-concrete the floor here. Uh, it was all chipped away and just covered in mud and it did really well. It held up very nicely. The tarp that I've put here, which again is temporary and I'll talk about it again in a minute. The tarp blew off and so all that mud and rain and everything was able to come down into here and did really well. It held everything back. I'm very happy with that. Okay, let's talk about the coffee can for a minute. The coffee can is temporary. Now, my next step on the well is I'm going to put in a well liner sleeve. To understand what a well is, what they do is they dig a hole straight down however many feet, in this case, 130 feet, and then they put a steel pipe. In this case, a six and a quarter inch steel pipe down the hole. And that pipe holds groundwater from coming into the well and dripping down into the bedrock where the clean water is. Well, this one's getting kind of bad. I actually see a crack in it about 15 feet down. And so I'm going to do a, a repair on it. And I've been studying this repair. And, and the repair is, is you take, this is six inches. You take a, a four inch PVC pipe and they sell this boot down at the bottom that you place on the end of the PVC pipe and you slide it down the six and a quarter inch well casing and that boot holds a seal up against that well casing and so you just keep driving more and more pvc pipe down into the hole until you get down past the well casing now i don't know where the well casing is going to end so i'm just going to kind of guesstimate based on the feel of it which i've been researching uh, well diggers and well repair people have a camera that you can put down there. I don't have one of those. So I know the water goes down 60 feet. So I will at least go down 60 feet, probably 70 feet. And then I can get rid of the coffee can because then I'll have a four inch PVC pipe coming out of the hole. That'll work great. And then the next step is to get rid of the tarp. I'll put a little building around this and make it nice and it'll be pretty, but I want to get the tiny house finished first. Now, of course, it just it never ends with the well. A lot of people seem to think that this well is never going to work. He should have done it properly. And I am doing it properly. According to all the research I'm doing, I'm doing exactly like the professionals would do it. But I'm doing it one step at a time, and I'm not doing it all at once. So even if, it, like they say, it comes back to bite me, it's only going to bite me for a little while until I get to the next step. But one of the things that is, is a big concern in a lot of people is I don't have a pressurized tank. I, and they seem to think that in order for the well to work properly, you gotta have a pressurized tank. And that's just not a true statement. A lot of people will use these wells. They'll dig a well and they'll put a pump in it, just like I did a well pump. It goes down 130 feet and they run a pipe, just like I did. See, there's a black pipe right there, out of there. Now that black pipe on house wells will go right into a, a pressurized tank. Mine just goes right down to the bottom and I have a little faucet on it and it just pours out the water. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people use these kind of wells to water their gardens. So this is very typical. And the only thing I'm doing is I'm taking that water and I'm just putting it into an IBC tank down there where I stored the water. Then I can pump that into the camper or the tiny house. That's a, I'm gonna do the same exact thing. 
And that way I don't have to have grid electricity. I can run it off DC. So to clarify a little bit, this is the IBC tank. So all I do is I pump water into the IBC tank just a couple times a month. And you heard that noise right there? That's the RV pump kicking on. Now I was telling you about the outdoor wood furnace and here's the tarp, I got a tarp over it. And I've spent the last, I don't know, week and a half, maybe two weeks, building this thing and getting it all ready for winter. And it's doing really good. We've tested it out. It keeps us warm in there. Brought, we got down to 32 degrees the other day. It did fine in its test run. Right now I'm sealing the seams, making sure that we keep all the bad smoke and carbon dioxide and everything out of the camper. Now, several people have suggested that I wasted my time with this, that I should have focused my efforts on putting a wood stove at the tiny house location. This was experimental. This was a test. So I know what to do and I can do it better up there at the tiny house. So it wasn't a waste at all. This was a learning curve that I needed to go through so I can perfect it up there. And secondly, we will not use this stove. We just bought it so we could have something temporary until we can move into our tiny house. Hopefully, you know, no later than this time next year. And so we spent minimal amount of money to build something to keep us warm in the camper. We intend to leave this down here after we move into the tiny house so we can raise chickens and, you know, any type of animals, maybe rabbits, and we can keep them warm through the winter. So what we're going to do as far as wood heat in our tiny house that we're gonna start working on again next week, is there is a concrete pad underneath all this metal. So what I'll do is we'll go ahead and get a real wood furnace. One that's manufactured. It won't be an outdoor wood furnace, it'll be an indoor wood furnace. I've been watching videos on how to modify indoor wood furnaces so you can run them outside. It's the same principle as what we have but you gotta make a few modifications. You gotta take the plume off the top, modify the plume, cover it up, run it into your house. Then what we'll do is we'll actually build a building around the wood furnace just to keep the elements off of it. Again, we'll use DC blowers to blow heat in. Of course, with the heat exchanger idea, as long as you got the heat going up and into your house, you don't really need a blower, but we do it just to, for that extra ventilation, make sure we get plenty of heat in there. And the thing is, is if I hadn't had the experience building the wood furnace that we currently have, I may not have understood the process enough to actually use a wood furnace. I mean, I just assumed you had to have a blower system. And once I started really researching this and figuring it out, I realized you don't need a blower, it can do it naturally. So I'm glad I went through that process. I want to talk about the generator just for a minute and my solar panels. It's important to understand that if you're going to run lead acid batteries, which in my thinking is very cost effective, I can get a lead acid battery to last at least two years. I know because we have got one in there that's two years old and it's still going strong, nothing wrong with it. But when you have your batteries being charged by solar, you don't get in a very efficient charge onto your lead acid batteries. You occasionally have to do an efficient charge and you have to do that with an automobile battery charger you can go to walmart you pick them up you get a battery charger and so in order to run the battery charger i have to run the generator generator powers the battery charger and then i charge the batteries that gives me an efficient charge and so you do that a couple times a month you only have to run the generator I, well this morning i did it uh, and it was about two and a half to three hours not very long now the thing is, is you got to kind of plan out when you're going to do it because you don't want to do it on sunny days. On sunny days, you want to be using your solar panels to run all your heavy equipment. Anytime I get a chance to use my saw or my drill, I try to wait until it's sunny so I have plenty of power to run my saw. As a matter of fact, the other day I was cutting firewood with my reciprocating saw. Well, on cloudy days like this, and you know it's going to be cloudy, that's when you need to take the opportunity a couple times a week to maintenance your battery. If you don't maintenance your battery, your batteries will wear out really quick. And I would say they will, will wear out within six months to a year. If I had to go buy lithium batteries, I'd have to figure out how to keep them warm during the winter because you don't want to put them inside because they can be dangerous 
if they catch on fire, they're hard to put out. Water actually increases the flames. They're very expensive. They can be up to $1,000 for a battery. To me, it's not cost effective to run a lithium where I don't have to have the generator. But with the generator, I gotta have the generator anyways. There are times that I'm just going to have to have the generator, especially since I'm building a tiny house or because I'm gonna be building anything. I like to build things. So I need the generator sometimes just to run the circular saw and different things. So if I need the generator anyways, I just as well have lead acid batteries and just maintain them occasionally. And this little generator uses a gallon of gas every 11 hours. Took me three hours to charge the batteries this morning. So it's not like I'm just chewing through gasoline either. I'm using about a can of gas every month and a half. So it's not a lot. And that's with me running power tools and setting up the camper and all of it. Thanks for watching.